This weekend, we'll see many iconic landmarks across the globe lit up in green to mark St. Patrick's Day, the world-renowned national holiday of Ireland, celebrated by the Irish, the Irish diaspora, descendants of Irish emigrants, and basically anyone who wants to be Irish for a day. The 17th of March is always a date for celebration. Now, this Sunday, here in Paris, a St. Patrick's Day parade will be taking place around the Pantheon in the 5th arrondissement and the Irish Cultural Centre. However, celebrations aside, Ireland has found its itself in the front line of the Brexit conundrum, as the remaining EU27 and Ireland want to ensure there is no return to a hard border with Northern Ireland once or when the UK leaves the Union. Now today, I'm joined in studio by the Ambassador of Ireland to France, Her Excellency Patricia O'Brien. Patricia, you're very welcome to the programme today. Thank you very much, David. Now, with everything very much up in the air, with parliamentary votes in Britain over Brexit deals, let's just leave that to the side for one second. But Patricia, I'd like you to just give us a brief background of Franco-Irish relations over the past few years. Certainly. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's a, it's a great pleasure and indeed an opportunity for me to give a sense uh, to your listeners of the, uh, the depth and the strength of our relationship with France. I have been in this role now for nearly a year and a half, and uh, I have been struck really from the very first day at um, the depth of our relationship with France. Of course, I was very aware of it as an Irish person, that we are and feel very, very close to France and to French people. But there is no doubt that across all the various areas, across the spectrum of issues that we deal with and have in common, um, not least uh, our culture, our history, our economics, our politics, the, the strength of the links and the depth of our friendship and our closeness is quite extraordinary. And it has increased an enormous amount. And I have found that it has increased since I've arrived. Indeed, uh, I'm bringing on uh, or moving from that point. Um, what uh, changes in approach um, uh, has the Macron government brought to Ireland or relations with Ireland specifically now, unfortunately, going back to the B word, specifically with the advent of Brexit. Well, yes, thank you for that. Because before, just at a personal level, before I came to, to, to Paris to take on my role, I had an idea of what this job would entail. But of course, what I hadn't quite anticipated was the extent of the dynamism and energy of the president uh, of France, uh, combined with the challenges which the issue of Brexit would pose to all of us in Irish embassies across the world. Um, but particularly, I would say, in relation to my particular role, the extent of the increase of engagement uh, with the French authorities that Brexit has caused us to have, and in a very, very positive way, I must say. Now, indeed, what role has Ireland's diplomatic mission in Paris specifically played, if you will, in boosting French support, or European support, one could say, for Ireland's position on Brexit and, of course, this infamous backstory? Stop. Well, yes, uh, there is no doubt that uh, the negotiations on Brexit have both caused us and allowed us to engage much more uh, intensely uh, with, with the French authorities and indeed with French people across the board, uh, with French business, um, with French industry, with French politics. Um, we have found from the very beginning of uh, this issue, indeed even before the referendum, but certainly once the referendum had taken place, um, that uh, France has been an extraordinary support for Ireland. And it has been necessary since your specific question was on how we in the embassy have worked on this issue. Since the very beginning, we have, in, we have been, uh, the doors have been very, very open for us, at both their doors and the French authorities' door and our doors for uh, French access. We have spoken intensely uh, and continued continually and consistently with France, with the French authorities, who have, as I say, been absolutely committed and relentless in their support for Ireland, in their deep understanding of the Irish position, uh, not
not least, of course, the uh, challenges that this poses to uh, the peace process, to the border of Ireland, uh, and to the, the, the basis of the, the Good Friday Agreement, which France has been very understanding and very supportive of us in all the negotiations. Now, ahead of the arrival of uh, Thornister, that's the Deputy Prime Minister in Irish, and uh, he's also Minister of Foreign Affairs, that's Simon Coveney, who's going to be coming here to Paris um, on Friday. Can you give us an idea of what uh, Ireland or how Ireland feels the consequences of Brexit will be for the EU and Ireland and for Northern Ireland? I mean, what are, in your opinion, or in the opinions of, let's say, the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ireland, uh, the best and worst case scenarios here? Well, of course, we have regretted the decision in the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. We have regretted this from the very beginning. We continue to regret it. However, we respect the decision. And therefore, we uh, have worked very intensively to seek to, first of all, protect the interests through the, the government, the Taoiseach, the Tornishta, all the Minister for European Affairs, have worked very intensively with all of the government to protect uh, the interests of Ireland, the peace process, the Good Friday Agreement, um, that to ensure that there will not now or ever be a hard border in Ireland. So we have been committed to the withdrawal agreement, to the backstop, and to ensure ensuring that the backstop would be and all the issues around the backstop would be uh, protected. The, uh, the European Union has showed tremendous solidarity and understanding and appreciation of the issues uh, that are involved in, in, within, this, uh, within this challenge um, and uh, to this day have been and we expect and have, have every reason to believe this support will continue into the future. Um, we are very uh, disappointed of course, um, and both the Taoiseach and the Tornishta and the government generally have expressed their disappointment at what has been happening, not least in the, over the last few days, not least, of course, in particular yesterday. However, we still believe that the there should be an orderly Brexit. We respect the decision that has been made, but that orderly Brexit must involve, as far as we are concerned, a, a, a ratification of the withdrawal, should involve a ratification of the withdrawal agreement um, and and, uh, and the backstop. Um, so we still, we are optimistic, we still always live in, in hope. However, uh, we are also realistic and recognise the difficulties at the moment. Um, so. And indeed, uh, when looking at realism, uh, we have to also look at import and export issues uh, that uh, a no-deal Brexit could pose for trade between or import and exports between France and Ireland. And that's because we don't really know what will happen to uh, the land bridge, if you will, that is the UK. There's a lot of haulage that comes across the UK coming into ports such as Calais, etc. Um, we have ports around Europe that are really bracing themselves for this. So, um, I mean... What are the issues do you feel that really have to be addressed with import and export because of Brexit or what might happen with Brexit? Well, obviously, trade is, is, is a, the, the impact of Brexit on, on our trade is of real concern. Uh, we have been working uh, very hard uh, on the issue of contingency plans and preparedness for a hard Brexit, uh, contingency for a hard Brexit, preparedness for Brexit. And uh, uh, we have been looking at this issue very, very particularly, the question of the use of the land bridge. But it's not the only issue. It's not the only challenge in relation to the transportation of goods from and to Ireland. Um, but on the land bridge, as you've raised it specifically, just to say that, just to give you an indication of the intensity of our work, I have last week been to Calais to discuss these issues uh, with, uh, with various departments from Dublin. I led a, a large delegation of departments from our, from our system um, and indeed a representation from, from the embassy and from the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin to lead discussions with the authorities in Calais about the future and about the future challenges that a Brexit uh, will be bringing. Um, we are working on the question of of the land bridge and on the question of imposition of, of, of tariffs and fees, etc. Um, and of course,
course, on, on general trade issues. And then yesterday or the day before, I was in Rennes to discuss uh, with the authorities there the questions of increased maritime links uh, and the potential for increasing our maritime links with Ireland uh, and France. And of course, that discussion was also part of our discussions in Calais. So this is just an example of the intensity of the work which we are conducting in order to ensure that there is there continues to be a fluidity of trade um, after Brexit. OK, but of course, yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, because there are a lot of uh, <laughs> European institutions as well that uh, are jumping ship, if you will, uh, because of Brexit and the e UK is uh, pulling out of the EU. Um, uh, has there been every, any rivalry, uh, let's just say, between Dublin and Paris uh, in attracting uh, any of these UK institutions, be it EU institutions or even financial institutions? There's been a bit of a serenade songs uh, been, been coming out from both capitals. Well, I, to, to, to put it in a nutshell, I think there is a very good-natured rivalry between Paris and Dublin. Um, of course, uh, we are doing everything we can to uh, attract uh, both the more in the more broad sense, but also the financial institutions. We are looking to, uh, to increasing engagement and to attracting them to Dublin, of course. But as I say, it's a good-natured rivalry, and it isn't just with Paris. You know, of course, that there's Frank Frankfurt, uh, Luxembourg. I mean, others are in the mix as well. But we are absolutely uh, sensitive to the opportunity um, that lies ahead for us. And we will be making the best of that opportunity, as we believe France will. You'll be keeping the flag flying. Now, uh, let's uh, take a look at, uh, well, a kind of a thorny issue and also a, a more recent uh, issue that uh, has been coming out of uh, the Elysee Palace. It's um, uh, but France is really looking to clamp down on GAFA tax avoidance. That is, of course, Google, Apple, Facebook and Amazon. Um, how has that played out with Ireland being the European hub for the big tech companies? And of course, there's always the thorny issue of the 12.5% corporation tax. So which shall we deal with first? Well, I suppose, and I, I'm, I'm glad you've put them in, in the same basket, because what I find is that they are, of course, not in the same basket. Uh, but there is there is a real, I, I, I have experienced a, um, a, a surprise at the amount of misunderstanding mm. and confusion between the issues of corporation tax and the digital. Of course, there is a link. Uh, but uh, first of all, on, on corporation tax, as you know, the Irish government is absolutely committed to maintaining and sustaining our position uh, uh, in relation to the 12.5% corporation tax. Um, as you know, uh, we have been committed to this approach, uh, which is goes back much longer than people think. Our, our approach to corporation tax, the competitive tax policy, goes back indeed to our industrial policy of the 1950s. So we have simply been developing this consistent with our engagement on, on this issue over uh, over the years. Um, we have uh, very much uh, worked within the context of the work of the, of the OECD. Um, we have uh, engaged within that sphere and we have brought about a number of reforms uh, which fall within the OECD uh, reporting, for example, on the BEPS, mm. uh, uh, base erosion uh, uh, profit sharing. And this is something that that we we are proud of the reforms that we have made, but I don't believe personally I, and professionally I don't believe that we are given sufficient credit for the amount of commitment that we have to this global approach to uh, reform of corporation tax, uh, to 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 taxation generally, and to our approach on corporation tax. As I say, our government is absolutely committed to maintaining a competitive tax policy. We believe that our approach is fair. And, uh, and we intend to continue with it. With regard to GAFA, the digital tax approach, um, as, as you're aware, uh, we, uh, we are very much uh, uh, aware of the mood and of the change of approach that has been taking place over time. We, on the other hand, uh, and at, at the same time, are committed to maintaining our position, um, but we believe very strongly that reform to 
uh, this tax sh must be done again in a global context. So we intend to continue the work which we are doing with, uh, with the OECD um, to ensure that the tax, and we believe strongly that this tax, along with the general taxation issues, should be fair and just. We support that. But it needs to be done in a sustainable and global way, which should be into the future, done and now and into the future under the rubric of the OECD to ensure that global approach. And um, we believe that uh, this taxation should be on the it should be implemented on the basis of where value uh, arises. Mm -hmm. And that is something to which we are committed and intend to continue working towards that goal to ensure a common an understanding and a global understanding of what we mean when we say value creation. And that is the essence of, of where we are moving. Indeed, it is a hot potato that will, uh, uh, they're going to see if they can remedy it on a European wide basis or a Europe wide basis in the future. That will be the perfect uh, way of tackling it. But moving away from GAFA and tax avoidance and uh, uh, corporation tax thorns and sides, Let's have a look at something that's a little bit more mundane, let's just say, but it's also something that is very interesting. And that is, of course, the spike in Irish passport applications uh, here in France. How have you been tackling the, uh, the spike in passport applications? Because I know a lot of colleagues here who've got Irish uh, ancestry who are uh, queuing up at Rue Rude to get their passports. Uh, and we know all across uh, other embassies around um, Europe that there, there's been an inundation of requests. Uh, is this all directly linked to Brexit? Well, yes, uh, I can certainly say uh, <laughs> from the perspective of uh, uh, Rue Rude mm. that uh, uh, you're absolutely right. There has been an exponential increase in applications. Um, Yes, of course, this is connected to Brexit, but I would say that it's not exclusively Brexit related. Mm. We have to bear in mind that uh, Irish people, we love to travel, we love to move around the world, and that there has been an, an, a natural increase in interest in travel. Um, so that also is an additional factor. I would say you're totally right. I mean, last year, the statistic was quite extraordinary. We have over 800,000 applications last year and it's looking as though this year there'll be an even greater number. And here in France, of course, we have our proportion of that to carry. But I take the opportunity and thank you, David, uh, to mention our online uh, passport application, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which we have rolled out uh, um, some uh, a year and a half ago or more. And um, it is available and it is something that I would encourage Irish people to avail of to renew their passports because it can be done online and it's extremely efficient. I think it comes normally the uh, turnaround time is about 10 days. So that's really quite good. And I, I, I would, as I say, take the opportunity. So thank you. OK, and very serendipitous it is that this is all in place in these turbulent times with what is happening in Brexit. Oh, I mentioned the B word again. OK, let's move back to why we are speaking here today. And that is, of course, to take a look ahead at St. Patrick's Day. That is uh, this Sunday, the 17th of March. Um, tell us about the St. Patrick's Day celebrations that are coming up here in Paris. Well, um, it's a real mix of everything good in Ireland. We have culture, the arts, Indeed, we have politics, as uh, as we mentioned, the Tornishta mm. and uh, Minister Halligan are both uh, coming uh, to Paris. It's a real honour for us. Um, and I think it's a recognition of the importance of Irish-French relations that the Tornishta has chosen to come to France at this very significant moment for us uh, and indeed at this very significant time for Ireland, for him to be with us. So at a political level, that will be there. But of course, he will also, they will also, so be dealing with issues of, of culture uh, and the arts and uh, and engaging with the Irish community here in Paris. So we have, of course, as you mentioned, the St. Patrick's Day uh, parade on Sunday, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, I have been invited to read uh, the uh, to read at uh, in Sacre Coeur on oh. Sunday morning mm. and in other churches uh, over the weekend. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, the St. 
Patrick's Day Parade from the Centre Culturel, I think will be an extraordinary moment. It is, of course, only the second uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade and uh, we will have our, our Minister Halligan will be with us. The uh, Mayor of the Fifth um, will be honouring us with her presence. So I think that's also very significant for the Centre, which is, of course, uh, something that we're extremely proud of. Um, and we work very closely, of course, with, with the Centre. It is our centre of culture mm-hmm. um, in, 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 in France. So um, I, I'm very much looking forward to the next four days, but it will be very intense uh, and uh, very challenging at many levels, but something really positive for us. And indeed, that uh, parade, which will be getting underway at 1pm on the Sunday. And RFI will be covering the parade, Great. actually. There should be a few of us up there, anyhow, to, uh, to join in the festivities. Um, but what I would like to say is, first and last, thank you very much, uh, Patricia O'Brien, Ambassador to France, Ambassador of Ireland to France. Uh, thank you very much for coming to the programme today. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. 